Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all. A very warm welcome on behalf of the IPB events team. We are very much looking forward to supporting you with today's webinar, Universal Health Coverage and Eye Health, New Targets for a New Decade. And I'm now delighted to hand over to Jennifer to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Debs. Ministers, Excellencies, Government Delegates, Friends. Welcome everyone to this virtual technical briefing in the sidelines of the 74th World Health Assembly on universal health coverage and eye care, new targets for a new decade. My name is Jennifer Gersbeck and I'm the Executive Director of Global Advocacy at the Fred Hollows Foundation, an international NGO working in eye health. I'm also a member of the Board of Trustees with the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. And I'm speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in Sydney, Australia. We are meeting at such a momentous time in the history of global health. We are all living through a global pandemic, the likes almost none of us living today have ever seen a crisis and a challenge affecting every corner of the globe. And we offer our thoughts and best wishes to all those who have been touched directly by COVID-19 and mourn those whose lives we've lost. We are also on the cusp of a new era in global eye health. Almost four years ago to the day, I stood on the stage at an event at the 70th World Health Assembly, where member states called on the World Health Organization to develop the first ever world report on vision. It was intended to take stock of global eye health, the strengths and remaining challenges, and to also chart a path forward. Following the Assembly's adoption of Resolution 73.4 last year, on integrated people-centered eye care, we are hopefully about to complete that journey of setting a new course in the next few days. We are poised for the assembly to adopt new global targets for eye health, to give the world a newfound ambition to 2030. Yesterday's Committee A session was a great start and extremely promising with a good show of support for the targets from so many member states. The committee will return to the eye health item later this week, and we do hope all government delegates tuning in will put their support behind the targets being adopted. Now, today we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to share with you their reflections the work being done to help us all move forward and experiences of work underway on the ground. So to get us started, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the first of our two special keynote addresses. It's my privilege to welcome the Honourable Mr. Budi Gennady Siddiquan, Minister for Health of the Government of Indonesia. We have been so fortunate to have Indonesia's leadership and guidance over the years, particularly in shaping the new agenda for eye health. Minister, thank you indeed for joining us. You have the floor. His Excellency Sally Mansfield, Australian Ambassador to the United Nations, Mr. Peter Holland, Chief Executive Officers of IAPB Munaza Gilani, and also Dr. Bente Mikkelsen, Director of WHO. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to speak in this event. I was informed that 1.1 billion people were living with untreated impaired vision globally in 2020. In Indonesia, 8 million people are affected. 20% of them are blind and 80% of them can be restored through surgery. And most of them are having cataract issues. Next slide. Economically, it costs Indonesian people a lot. 
it cost us to treat those people it cost us because they lost productivity and it cost us because family members need to help them and need to support them total economic loss that we have calculated is around seven billion dollars per year next slide to address this issue Indonesia is strongly committed to achieve universal health coverage on eye health which will also help Indonesia in achieving the sustainable development goals number three next slide among all those eye issues we are focusing on cataract and refractive error on cataract we would like to increase 30% in effective coverage of cataract surgery by 2030. In the refractive error, we would like to increase 40% in effective coverage of refractive error by 2030. So overall, it will reduce the visual impairment by 2030 around 25%. Next slide. To achieve those expected outcome, we have developed four strategic actions. And the first and the foremost important, we would like to do education to improve Indonesian people awareness and demand to seek eye screening. And we will follow up with screening to detect cataract and refractive error at the early stage. We will also do surveillance activity to actively seek out communities, people, or members of the family with eye health problem. And the last one, we would like to make, make sure that we develop a quality treatment to have access and quality surgery for people with cataract and corrections for refractive error. Next slide. Ladies and gentlemen, we are convinced that we can do those two initiatives because we have strength. We have more than 3,000 ophthalmologists. We have more than 10,000 primary health care and we have more than 3,000 hospitals. And historically, we have done over 250,000 cataract surgeries per annum at those 3,000 hospitals. Next slide. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia would like to contribute to solving the, the healthcare on the eye issues globally. And we believe addressing avoidable vision loss will help contribute to a healthier, safer, and more equitable world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, uh, and thank you for Indonesia's continued leadership in eye health. It's now my pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Ms Sally Bansfield, Australian Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations and to the Conference on Disarmament to deliver the second keynote. Australia has been such a great friend and leader in global health for many, many years, and we are so delighted that you could join us. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you so very much indeed, Jennifer. And it's a very great honor and pleasure for me to be able to follow the address from His Excellency Budi Ganadi Sarikin, Minister of Health of the Republic of Indonesia, and to thank Indonesia in particular for their deep commitment to this issue, not just within Indonesia, but more, uh, more broadly as well. Australia has been so pleased to lead along with Indonesia the resolution on integrated people-centered eye care, including preventable vision impairment and blindness, which we did in 2020. And we thank the Indonesian government for their continued support and leadership on eye health. I welcome all those joining today who are blind or who have low vision. Um, today, I'm wearing glasses and I would like to mention 
the picture behind me, which was painted by an indigenous Australian who has a different sort of disability um, from when he had polio as a child. Um, but just a reminder that um, there are various different degrees of uh, vision impairment, but I hope you can see at least some sense of the picture behind me, which is called Nungilana and is, means to exchange gifts. And the description by Paul Calcott of his painting is, when we travel through community and different cultures, we need to sit, listen quietly and respect each other and the dreaming of that land. So I think wherever you are, we can share some dreaming today. I recognise the immense legacy left by ophthalmologist Fred Hollows. Thanks to his efforts, countless people are able to see and live out fuller, better lives. The continued work of his foundation is much appreciated. Alongside the Fred Hollows Foundation, I also thank the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness and its partners, including WHO, for bringing us together today to discuss the global burden of vision impairment and loss and how countries can progress toward universal access to eye care. Global rates of preventable vision impairment and blindness are predicted to rise in the coming years due to population growth, aging, environmental factors and lifestyle changes. Associated burdens on people and society disproportionately affect low and middle income countries and vulnerable populations such as women, migrants, indigenous peoples, persons with disability and rural communities. We are committed to improving the eye health of all Australians and our global efforts align with our strong domestic eye health agenda. In our region, Australia supports a health system strengthening approach to address all diseases including those related to eye health. This approach aligns with our commitment to universal health coverage for all. We continue to support eye health activities through the aid program with funding provided to accredited Australian non-government organisations. The development of global targets for the coverage of cataract surgery and refractive error that my Indonesian uh, colleague, the minister mentioned earlier is an important next step in addressing the vast inequities that exist in the prevalence of vision impairment and blindness. We thank the WHO technical team and the expert working group for their efforts in developing the proposed targets and for the comprehensive consultation process with member states. We would also like to specifically thank Dr. Alako Sieza for her tireless efforts and stewardship in helping drive WHO's global eye health agenda. The targets are a vital step toward driving eye health coverage in the future, while also delivering care of acceptable quality. Australia supports the adoption of these two targets at the World Health Assembly this week. Our thanks again to all those participating today, to all health workers for all that they do, and to um, the work in particular by the foundation um, and, and your colleagues, Jennifer. Many thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. And we look forward to Australia's continued guidance and leadership as we move forward through the decade and beyond. So I'd now like to invite representatives from the World Health Organization to provide us with a technical briefing on the exciting developments in global eye health and the fantastic work the WHO is doing to support member states and partners around the world. We are extremely grateful to be joined by Dr. Alako Sieza, Unit Head, Sensory Functions, Disability and Rehabilitation, and Dr. Stuart Keel, Technical Officer, Vision and Eye Care Program. Alakos, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer and Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. And I also feel humbled to see uh, how this, um, so how, how the, 
the whole or the, the all the endorsement that is coming from member states, but also from uh, civil society. So what I would like to do today is again um, recognize why we are here today. And uh, secondly, what brought us here to where we are. And it has been already mentioned and emphasized that we are here today because we are at the time of the 74th World Health Assembly. And uh, we were asked in the previous World Health Assembly by member states to deliver and to provide global targets to monitor comprehensive uh, um, people center, integrated people center eye care. And uh, that this target should be considered for adoption at this World Health Assembly in the 70th for World Assembly that is taking place this week. And what was what brought us here today, it has been a long journey, a long journey with a lot of successes. And uh, let's put some examples to those successes. First, there has been global advocacy efforts launched over the last 30 years. For example, the global initiative Vision 2020 was a pivotal initiative in achieving unified and coordinated advocacy for key priorities in eye care at global, regional, and national level. And as we see today, this coordinated advocacy continues moving the field forward. We have had in the last 20 years, five World Health Assembly resolutions, what also emphasize the great commitment from member states during the last uh, 20 years and even longer. And especially also, as we have heard today from Indonesia and from Australia, who is an example of that, of that commitment. Thirdly, is we have seen great successful in public health initiatives over the last years for infectious causes on blindness. Eye infections and blindness to, due to vitamin A deficiency, oncocercasis and trachoma has decreased in all regions during the last or during the past 30 years due to the implementation of large scale public health initiatives. And last but not least, scientific and technological advances have been around in the eye care sector for a long time. For example, telehealth is a successful strategy in many places. And we have seen that during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, where through telehealth, it was possible to, to reach those living in rural and remote areas in many countries. Still, despite despite all these successes, we are today with a feeling of urgency for action. And if I bring to the core of this urgency for action two facts, I would emphasize on the one hand, we have the urgency for action due to the large need for care. And on the other hand, hand because the large need for data. If we think of the large need for health, for, um, for care, this is because all eye, all eye conditions are universal. And some of these eye conditions are associated to vision impairment, but some or many are not. What we can, however, say is that all are associated with eye care needs. If we think of data, and this has also already been emphasized, we 
say that at least 2.2 billion people around the world have a vision impairment. But the accent needs to be put in the at least because the real, we don't even know what is the real number. We also say that at least 1 billion people has a vision impairment that could have been prevented or is still to be addressed. But still, we need to put the accent on the at least because we don't really know the number. We also know that there are many common eye diseases that don't cause vision impairment. But still, these conditions are leading cause for, for seeking care and lead to personal and financial hardships. So what we can really say is that we don't have the whole picture in terms of the global need for eye care and these numbers. For that reason, it's also so fundamental to move forward saying, actually, we don't have the global picture, but not yet. And it is fundamental that we move forward now endorsing these two targets and the monitor and the and the monitor and monitoring uh, the progress towards achieving them. These two targets and the indicators to monitor progress toward them are a starting point. They are a starting point because they will provide, they are proxy for the need and unmet need of eye care. They are also a starting point because they are a proxy for quality of eye care services. And that also emphasizes the importance. We need to focus on quality eye care services. And they are a starting point because they have the potential to drive further action. We know very well that only what gets measured gets done. And for that reason, it's so important to start measuring consistently the progression toward achieving those targets. And with this, I would like to pass at uh, to, to pass the floor to my colleague, Stuart Kip, who will elaborate uh, further on these two targets and indicators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alarcos. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to join with you here today on this very important event for the eye care sector. Over the course of the next 10 minutes, I would like to cover four key points. The first one being why these indicators are important. The second being what are the global targets and looking a little deeper into this. And then how these targets will be monitored over the coming decade. And then finish by, by discussing what WHO is doing to support member states in strengthening eye care within health systems. So let's start with point one and, and why these indicators. So these two indicators represent ideal global tracer indicators for the eye care sector for a number of reasons. The first reason being that they're grounded on cost-effective interventions. And in fact, some of the most cost-effective interventions of all of the health sector in the provision of spectacles and also cataract surgery. They're also linked with diseases as we've seen with a very high prevalence that is expected to increase over the coming decade with aging populations and also lifestyle factors. And we only have to really look at the growing epidemiology of myopia to understand this. In 2020, it's, it is estimated that 2.6 billion people live with myopia. And over the coming decade, this is estimated to increase to 3.3 billion. There is also a huge unmet need for treatment. Also, as we've heard this morning, it's very hard to believe in 2021 that there's still over 800 million people globally with a near or distance vision impairment that could be corrected with the appropriate pair of spectacles. We also have over 100 million people globally with moderate or severe distance vision impairment or blindness in need of cataract surgery. 
And for these reasons, also because these indicators consider different segments of the population in different age groups, they don't only represent important indicators to track changes in the uptake and quality of eye care services, but also to contribute to monitoring universal health coverage in general. There's also a very strong economic rationale for increasing coverage of these two indicators. So the estimated cost as, as uh, presented in the World Report on Vision in addressing the unmet need for refractive error and cataract surgery as presented on the previous slide is around $25 billion. So this may seem like a very large amount, but when taken into perspective, it only represents a very small fraction of the estimated annual global productivity losses associated with uncorrected refractive error alone from myopia and presbyopia that is estimated to be in excess of 260 billion annually. So are these indicators enough? So here it's very important to differentiate between global and national level monitoring, both being extremely important. So at, at the global level, the two indicators that we've discussed today serve as ideal tracer indicators, given the reasons I specified earlier. However, at the national level, a much more comprehensive range of indicators are required. And to this end, WHO is currently developing a more comprehensive menu of indicators that member states can select from to facilitate monitoring at the national and subnational level. So we've included some examples of these indicators, input, output, outcome and impact indicators, just to show that these indicators will be much more inclusive of other eye conditions and other important aspects in eye care. The second point to mention is looking at the targets themselves. And we, we've, we've touched on this earlier. For effective coverage of cataract surgery, the target is a 30 percentage point increase by 2030. So just as an example, if the baseline global estimate for effective coverage of cataract surgery is 30%, then the 2030 target will be a 60% coverage at the global level. For effective coverage of refractive error, a 40 percentage point increase by 2030 is the target. And it's important to mention here that both near and distance refractive error are considered within this indicator. It's also important to mention that these targets include key considerations so that they cater for settings with a high baseline coverage and also in order to ensure that equity is a fundamental component as the sector advances towards achieving and increasing coverage of these two indicators. Just briefly, the process undertaken to come up with these recommendations of the targets involves a consultative process including convening a group of academics, public health professionals and clinicians from the field to review existing data and make recommendations for the, for the targets. This then involved uh, these preliminary recommendations going through a consultation process with member states and non-state actors via a web-based consultation and informal member state consultation in October and November last year before being presented at the executive board earlier this year where they were endorsed, which has culminated in these targets now being presented for endorsement at the current World Health Assembly. So let's look now at how they will be monitored. And here I wanted to emphasize three key points to highlight the support WHO will provide in monitoring progress towards achieving these targets. The first one being that WHO is currently working with academic partners in the field to analyze existing population-based survey data to establish robust baseline estimates for these two indicators that will be available this year. The second being following feedback received during the consultation process and, and in particular at the executive board, WHO has now progressed work in developing a feasible and financially viable survey methodology to facilitate the collection of data on these two indicators. And the third point is to really promote more widespread data collection on these two indicators. We've now begun work to, to incorporate a standardised vision module within existing WHO surveys, including the STEP survey that is carried out in a large number of countries. So the objective of this monitoring uh, activities and data collection is to collect a representative volume of data, both geographically and across age groups from population surveys in a periodic manner, in a standardized manner, 
and to collect data and uh, in, a, in a disaggregated manner so we can keep track of inequities and equity as we progress towards achieving these targets. So for these indicators and targets to be successful in driving eye health coverage, we really urge all relevant stakeholders in the field to join efforts in this endeavour of collecting reliable data in all regions. And now to the last point that I wanted to cover and what is WHO doing to support member states to strengthen eye care in health systems? So for this, I would like to go back to the World Health Assembly resolution on eye care from 2020, where it was requested from member states to, to have support from, from WHO to implement the recommendations of the World Report on Vision. And in response to this request, WHO is developing a number of technical tools to help support with the implementations of the recommendations that you see on the left of screen. I won't go through all of these in detail, but amongst others, this includes the development of a competency-based framework to assist in workforce planning and development, the development of an eye care guide for action to support implementation of integrated people-centered eye care and to tie these tools together, the development of an M Health initiative in recognition of the importance of health promotion and prevention in the context of eye care and in particular refractive error and myopia. And what I wanted to do now is briefly focus on the first uh, key area of work, which is the package of eye care interventions as it directly relates to the indicators in discussion today. So in order to achieve an advanced integration of eye care into universal health coverage and in particular, national health services packages and policies, WHO is currently developing a package of evidence-based eye care interventions that will include priority interventions at all levels of care and also the resources required for their provision in terms of the workforce, equipment consumables, assistive products and infrastructure. So this package will of course include interventions for cataract and refractive error, but also many other eye conditions that can and those that typically do not cause vision impairment. So the reason I mention this tool is that this tool can be used by countries and stakeholders in the field in planning and costing towards scaling up interventions for refractive error and cataract surgery in these populations. And this tool will be available for use in 2021. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and pass back over to Jennifer. Thank you, Stuart. And to close from the WHO, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Bente Nicholson, Director of Non-Communicable Diseases and Promoting Health Through the Life Course, to make some closing remarks. Bente, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to the Fred Hollow uh, Foundation. And of course, with the continuous and extremely important support from Indonesia and Australia, and I would also like to thank uh, my team, uh, Alarcos, uh, and all the people working with and for her. So I want to start with saying that uh, the agenda of eye care and the prevention of blindness is core of the NCD agenda at WHO. And to add, this is one of the oldest programs for WHO. It started in 1978. So I think we all agree, no, it's time. It's time to really make a huge headway. So I think you already have guessed that we take a cross-programmatic approach uh, to address the key challenges uh, facing the eye care sector. For example, just now we have launched the WHO Global Diabetes Compact. And of course, diabetic retinopathy has been included as an essential part of the care covered by this compact. It is important. The statistics presented here today provide, of course, a sobering reminder of how much work needs to be done in the field and how seriously eye care should be taken. And I'm very happy to listen to the member states now discussing the resolution sponsored by 40 member states, and they are really taking this as serious as we want them to do. So that's very promising. Globally, it's difficult to imagine that uh, an estimated 1 billion people have vision impairment or blindness that could be addressed through access to spectacles and cataract surgery. 1 billion people and actually solutions at hand. 
As Stuart has so nicely presented today, given the large unmet need for care, coupled with the fact that high cost effective interventions exist, the eye care sector is well positioned to contribute to the advancement of universal health coverage within countries. And I would like to emphasize that because it's a fundamental priority over the coming decades that the implementation of integrated people-centered eye care is part of the universal health coverage and health system, because that's the way to make it standardized and to improve access to quality eye care services. Um, and it was in extremely encouraging, as I mentioned, to see all the member states stepping up and so much appreciation as well for the target development. Uh, so uh, we have been working on these targets and the targets are for 2030 has been mentioning several times already today. And uh, we hope that the 74th World Health Assembly will uh, adopt the resolution on Wednesday. So concerted efforts towards the target is fundamental in the order to drive eye care coverage in the future while delivering care of acceptable quality. However, as we all know, these indicators and related targets uh, has to be uh, driven also not only by WHO, but by all of you, friends of eye care, and also the support of all kinds of partners and stakeholders in the field. We need to join efforts. We need to uh, join hands to be sure that we are able to reach these targets. So in closing, uh, WHO is committed to continue to support member states to improve the delivery of eye care. Actually, we want to step up the country impact. And in particular, uh, through the development of technical tools and resources to support countries, to build capacity and to strengthen eye care within their health systems. So I thank you for organizing this uh, informal side event. And back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Bente. And thank you for all the work your wonderful team is doing to really help the world stride forward with this new agenda. We'll now move to reflections from in-country work on the ground and, our, and also our panel discussion. So Alakos and Stuart, if you could please stay with us. And I'd like to invite Dr. Fuk Win Tan and Ms. Mananza Galani to join us. Now to help shift a gear, Sightsavers has kindly shared with us the story of a riff. Hi, Cataract Surgical Team. I'm Arif. I'm really glad that Sightsavers Bangladesh has come to my home again. I'm really happy. Can you recognize where I'm at this moment? This is my childhood home, where you visited me when I was a child. I have come to visit my parents. This is my mother, and this is Asma. She works for Sight Savers. Hi. It's been a long time since your operation has done. 15 years back, that means in 2005, and you were only five years old child. Do you remember the day when the, you, after operation, your bandage removal? He just said that he feels very happy because it's the, for the first time he clearly see and identified his parents. Oh, wow. How do you think the operation has impacted in your life? My life has changed because of the cataract operation. Now I live in the city in Dhaka. I have a job there. I can see clearly and I can work. If I didn't have the operation, I could never have a job. So do you enjoy driving? Yes, I really like driving. I hope to buy a small vehicle of my own in the future. If it is Allah's will, I'll buy a vehicle for myself. This is my dream.
Yeah, I think it's uh, always so powerful to hear those human stories uh, behind the statistics. So now let me introduce Dr. Fukwin Tan, Director of Program Implementation Asia uh, with the Fred Hollows Foundation. Dr. Fook, can you please share with us your experience from the Foundation's work in the Western Pacific region? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm very happy today have an opportunity to share the experience of the work of the Foundation in East Asia and Western Pacific related to the advancing integrated people-centered eye care. The Foundation work in more than 25 countries to strengthen health system, and we work with community to improve their OI health. ACR had the largest number of people with blindness and a growing burden of moderate to the severe vision impairment due to a myopia epidemic in East Asia. So integrated people-centric eye care, iPad, provide a framework for us to address these needs and advance universal health coverage through coordinated, high quality and equitable eye care services. To support this goal, we are working with Ministry of Health in Ethiopia and the Philippines to implement a three-year project supported by Australian government to advance iPad and to translate the global eye health agenda into national action. We are aiming to advance practical implementation of iPad into national healthcare strategy, as well as within the Foundation O program. This will be achieved through several strategies, including the development, testing, and rollout the WSO technical tools, including the new eye care self assessment tool, ESCA. Critically, we are also providing the target is support to the national government to act on the recommendation and information that emerged from the ESCA process. We are also analyzing and seeking to build on the success of the existing ICA model. For example, the community eye health program in the Philippines, because we acknowledge that a lot of existing national healthcare framework, they achieve a success in addressing the equity, poor coverage, and community engagement in eye health. Key to our success had been strong relationship with the government stakeholder, the presence of the National Eye Care Coordination Body, like a Prevention of Planning Committee, thus including Ministry of Health, and resourcing to support government and other stakeholders to meet their commitment uh, under the Work How Assembly Resolution and implement the iPad within the iHealth system. That's all for me. Thank you for listening. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Now let me bring in Ms. Nanaza Galani, Site Savers Country Director for Pakistan. Manaza, can you please share with us some of your reflections working in eye care in Pakistan? Sorry. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whichever time zone you are watching from. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of this esteemed group of panelists and great audience uh, to share some updates from Pakistan on integration of eye care within the uh, UHC strategies. Um, overall, uh, in the last two decades, uh, there have been some significant improvements in Pakistan health sector. Uh, but at the same time, we are lagging behind on many fronts for different milestones and targets. And I reckon you would all agree with me that in such a situation in a developing country like Pakistan, where there are so many competing priorities to deal with um, uh, other life-threatening diseases burden, it requires very strong evidence and continuous advocacy efforts to uh, create a space for eye care within the UHC strategies. But thanks to our implementing partners, Ministry of Health and members of the National Health Committee, PRI NGOs, CBM, FHF, Ryan Holden Foundation, who have been really instrumental in the driving force on the advocacy front. Um, 
For achieving the target set for universal health coverage, the current government has launched the first ever flagship social health protection initiative called Sehat Surulat Program, which is currently being rolled out in two provinces of Pakistan. And the overall, overall aim or goal of the program is to improve the health status of the population, improve access to quality health services, and to reduce the poverty through minimizing out-of-pocket uh, health expenses. Uh, the basic uh, benefit package includes uh, the secondary and tertiary uh, hospital-based care services, which uh, amounts around uh, 1 million Pakistani rupees per household per year. And uh, we anticipate that in the first phase, uh, health insurance is going to be provided to around 15 million poor families uh, living below the poverty line. Um, I must uh, mention here that initially all the eye care treatments were not covered by this health insurance scheme, uh, but with the continuous advocacy of all the stakeholders through different platforms of uh, National Eye Health Committee, partner hospitals, and national and provincial programs for prevention of blindness, these are all now covered by this insurance scheme. Um, let me mention some other key developments during 2020 and 21 for the eye care integration towards uh, UHC. Uh, the development of five years integrated people-centered eye care plans um, with package of eye care interventions just mentioned by the earlier speaker uh, at national and provincial levels in complete alignment with the WHO's framework on integrated people-centered services and the priorities of World Report on Vision. Uh, these five years Pakistan plans uh, from 2020 to 25 are actually the midterm strategic plans designed to contribute towards uh, uh, a 10 years long term um, perspective outlook to achieve the universal health coverage by 2030. Uh, the inclusive eye health task force established under the National Eye Health Committee has been really instrumental for promoting the inclusive programming and integration within the optometry training curriculum. Uh, which has the capacity to be replicated in all the optometry schools. Uh, the eye health, uh, inclusive eye health programs um, initially piloted and implemented by site servers in partnership with the uh, uh, public sector hospitals and uh, very renowned charity hospitals, LRBT, has created a very strong evidence to address barriers for universal health coverage, especially for improving access of quality eye care by people with disabilities. So I'm very conscious of time. Uh, so that was a brief snapshot of updates on uh, inclusive, equitable eye health delivery and programming in Pakistan. And uh, we believe this is making strong strides towards eye care integration within the universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Minaza. Um, if I could move to you, uh, Alakos, um, one of the biggest challenges is to better integrate eye health within broader health strategy and across other government departments beyond health. What advice can you offer to various government and non-government actors to start making that shift? Oh, you're on mute, Alakos. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And do you know, I think that actually at the end of the day, it, it goes back to four concrete ingred ingredients. I would say it is about recognize, commit, act, and monitor. Let me uh, elaborate a little bit on these four ingredients. Recognize, first of all, both governments and civil society at large need to recognize that eye care services is still are provided in parallel systems, and that parallel system le lead to inefficiencies, to unsustainability, and then also to inequalities. And recognition is really the first step for action. So if that, if it, that is lacking, then things will not follow. Second, commit. And why commit? Because we need to commit to coordination and integration because at the end of the day, coordination and integration are primarily a governance and leadership issue. And without commitment, things will not happen. And of course, then after there is recognition and commitment, we can act. 
And the whole report yeah. on vision, as has been mentioned today several times, provides a series of concrete actions that need uh, to be implemented in order to achieve integration. Let me here today emphasize the strengthening of primary eye care uh, within um, primary health care. So basic eye care interventions and appropriate referral system need to be integral part of primary health care in order to address the huge need for care uh, that we are facing today still in 2021, and especially the unmet need. And fourth, after recognition, commitment, action, of course, we need to monitor. Only if we monitor, things will happen. And uh, I, as I said before, only what get measured gets done. And uh, again, great to see the commitment from governments and uh, stakeholders at large from civil society towards this monitoring. So back to you now, thank you. Thank you, Alakos. Um, look, unfortunately, we are running quite behind time here and there's a whole raft of questions that I wanted to ask the panel. But in the interest of time and finishing on time, um, I think we'll, we'll need to close the panel session there and thank our, our panelists so much for uh, participating today. I also know that there's um, been a few questions posed in the Q&A box. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to go through those questions, but if you have any, um, you are able to email IAPB events and we'll pop that email address in the chat box mm -hmm. and we'll do our best to answer those questions um, offline. So um, before we do wrap up, I would like to um, invite Peter Holland, uh, CEO of the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, to share his reflections on behalf of the eye health sector. So Peter, over to you. Uh, Jennifer, thanks very much. Uh, and uh, I just echo what you just said. Please do send us the questions, any questions you have, and we'll we'll absolutely endeavour to get back to you. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists today for their participation, but particularly thank uh, WHO for uh, all the amazing work that you've done over the past year. It's been particularly difficult, but really the agenda in implementing the World Report on Vision has really been pushed forward, and we're really grateful for all that work. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank Minister Sadiqin and Ambassador Mansfield for your support today and, and also for the leadership your government has shown over many years, really, in taking, in taking forward this agenda and, and for that leadership on eye health globally. Um, we, heard, we heard from Alarcos uh, about the urgency of the issue. And in, in many respects, the numbers speak for themselves. We've got over a billion people who are needlessly living with poor vision because they don't have access to basic eye care services. Uh, and without action, that number will rise, it will almost double to, to 1.8 billion and over half the population will have myopia by 2050. So, so we really do think that the adoption of the global targets this week is a really important step in ensuring that we can begin to address that. We're really encouraged, uh, as a number of speakers said by the supported state statements from member states yesterday, and we look forward to seeing them adopted uh, later in the week, because they'll set our ambition. And, and as Alarcos and Stuart set out so clearly, and they, uh, they're great targets for enabling us to monitor progress on the implementation of integrated people-centered eye care. And of course, as we've heard, eye health critical to universal health coverage. Indeed, universal health coverage isn't universal without eye care. And as Stuart showed so clearly, these indicators are not just great indicators for eye care, but they're great indicators for universal health coverage uh, itself. And so we strongly support their inclusion in frameworks for monitoring the implementation of UHC as a whole. Uh, and, and as uh, the video of Ari showed so clearly, eye health goes, of course, much wider. Uh, improving eye health helps reduce poverty, delivers good quality education, decent work, and gender equality. And in many respects, it's a golden thread running through many of the sustainable development goals. So we're really delighted that the targets aren't just being considered here, but they've also been included in the, uh, in the first UN resolution on vision, uh, which is currently being negotiated in New York, and we hope will be agreed in the coming weeks. And that resolution really draws out that strong connection 
between eye health and achieving the sustainable development goals. So, so I'd echo uh, Dr. Mickelson. Uh, this is something we, we all have to join hands. And I know in what is obviously, we're living in astonishingly difficult times, but when I know across the eye sector, my colleagues across the sector are ready to support countries to implement uh, integrated people-centered eye care uh, and ensure that we're able to achieve the targets uh, that we will set this week uh, uh, by the end of the decade. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. So that does bring our time almost to an end. I would like to thank once again our special keynote speakers, Minister Sadigan, Ambassador Mansfield, the governments of Australia and Indonesia, the World Health Organization, and thank you to my colleagues from the IAPB, CBM, Light for the World, Sight Savers, and also the Fred Hollows Foundation in making this event possible. So in closing, I would like to say that the world is undoubtedly facing enormous challenges at the moment, yet with the right ambition and through collaboration, innovation, and the collective will to take action, I believe we can overcome these challenges and together stride towards 2030 with energy and optimism, ensuring that everyone everywhere has access to affordable quality eye health services where and when they need them. So thank you everyone and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening and maybe good night. Um, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us today.